All right, this is the Pro Wrestling Illustrated Podcast. I'm your host, PWI senior writer, Al Castle, joined as always by my co-host, Brian Solomon. How's it going? Happy to be here as always, Al. Thanks for having me back. Yes, and uh, back with us, the boss, uh, PWI editor-in-chief, Kevin McElvaney. How are you, buddy? Great. Good to be back on the show. Thanks for having me. Yes, got to see you in person over uh, the weekend. We've extended our condolences. Uh, obviously, we've, we've talked yeah. in the last episode about your loss, and uh, good to have you back in, in the fold here. And, and great to see you and, and the mothership being uh, uh, PWI. I didn't stop by the offices, but I was in the neighborhood, and uh, it's so pretty there this time of year. Yeah, I actually ended up spending the whole day in, what was it? Lansdale, Pennsylvania, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a nice, nice, nice town, nice area in general yes anyhow we we've got a lot to uh discuss the the women's 250 issue is out we were hoping to discuss it now but couldn't coordinate having one of uh the the uh ranking committee uh members we didn't want to have a discussion about the women's 250 without any women here um so we're going to put that off until uh hopefully uh, the next episode uh but there's no shortage of uh current events to talk about we've got another i still call them pay-per-views i guess they call them premium live events ple's it doesn't flow off the tongue as well well as uh well, I never said PPVs, but you're right, PPVs, the pay-per-view. Um, Crown Jewel back in uh, Saudi Arabia with, um, I think, a, a big main event in uh, Roman Reigns and LA Knight. We'll talk a little bit about that. Brian and I have been talking about LA Knight the last few episodes, and this is the next big step, uh, I think, for uh, this character that they, they seem to be investing a lot in. We'll, we'll talk a little about that. Uh, talk about... Impact Wrestling and the return of TNA, and, and Kevin's got some perspective having been at Bound for Glory for uh, the announcement, and uh, some news out of uh, AEW, Tony Khan's latest, uh, speaking of TNA, you know, his late, latest kind of uh, homage to Dixie Carter, the world shattering, and maybe I'm exaggerating, but he's got another big announcement coming up, and, and there have been a few, and uh, other news coming out of there, so we'll talk about it all. Uh, but real quick, let's talk about the latest issue of Pro Wrestling Illustrated. And Kevin, we haven't talked to you um, since the release of, of the 500. We've talked a little bit about the feedback we've gotten. How's the feedback uh, you've gotten? Is is, is your uh, mountain of hate mail uh, higher than ours? <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess so. It's uh, <laughs> mostly, you know, because I have my eyes across the main accounts pretty frequently. So a lot of it comes in there. But I certainly gotten some nasty emails and things like that. Um, less so with the women's 250 list. That generally is the case. Although uh, the English speaking Joshi fandom are ruthless and they you can't do anything right by them. So there's a lot of, really? lot of yeah. What's lot, the big complaint? Were they, did they want number one? So it's, uh, it's partly that, but it's also just, oh, you didn't rank my favorite from the smaller Joshi league, or you didn't rank them high enough. Or uh, a big one was Hazuki from FWC and stardom was left off because she was basically a tag wrestler this year. Um, but it's, yeah, people just get very upset. And, and again, to emphasize, this is largely Joshi fans from the U S Canada and England, not, not Joshi fans from Japan. They're, they're more interested to uh, see where people rank and how we consider them versus how they're covered, you know, in Japan. How, how does that compare to the emails saying, um, about the Joshi wrestlers, who the hell are these women? You know, why are they all over the top ten? Where is whatever insert sure. female WWE wrestler? <laughs> I'd um, rather get the 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 nitpicking about where is my favorite and why uh, why is this Joshi wrestler not ranked higher rather than the who? As if you know we haven't been covering to some degree. I mean, I, I'm not going to pretend that we covered it nearly as much. But I mean, you go back to the 80s and 90s and All Japan Women was mentioned. We ran photos, you know, so it's the difference now is it's a little easier for us to get access and actually talk to some of these wrestlers and people behind it, whereas that was a little tougher back in the day. So um, I think in general, people who read the magazine regularly, even if they don't agree with it, they're curious enough to look into it and make it an informed decision for themselves. And to me, that's that's the, the best thing. If We don't all have to agree on it, but... Um, better to have curiosity and then satiate curiosity than to just kind of stick in your bubble forever. Yeah, that's a much healthier attitude. And I remember even from my own, you know, as a young fan reading magazines, like when you would see somebody that the magazines were putting over yep. and you didn't know who that person was, like I, 
I mean, I can't speak for everybody, but my attitude always was, I need to find out about this person like that they're making a big deal out of. I, I never, I don't watch this company or I never heard, but obviously it must be a big deal, you know, blah, right. blah, blah. And there were a lot of wrestlers like that way back who lived in my imagination that I had never seen, but I knew they were important, you know, like that's, I don't know, intellectual curiosity. Yeah, that's the balance that we got to strike as, you know, the leading pro wrestling magazine uh, in the country and in the world is, is uh, you know, both reflecting what uh, American fans are into, but also being ahead of them, right, and and uh, introducing them um, to, to different stars from all over the world. Um, uh, Brian, again, not, not to get too deep into the, the women's uh, list, and, and neither you or I or that hands uh, on it. I do some of the writing, but, but not that involved in um, the picking. Um, what do you think about Rhea Ripley, number one? I, I think, and, and Kevin might have some insight, I think it was a gimme this year, right? Yes, I think it's a great choice. And, uh, you know, it's not not every choice has to be controversial, right? I mean, I, people are always going to find ways to disagree or things that they don't like. And, and I think one of the things that might, uh, you know, one of the only complaints I hear is people saying that she doesn't wrestle enough. But I mean, like, I don't know. I, I almost feel like you can pick and choose who you want to say that about, especially if you don't have an awareness of house shows and things like that. Right. Uh, I, I think it's to me a no brainer and it's a good combination because it's somebody who definitely has earned it by our criteria, but at the same time is also somebody who just in your gut feels like the dominant woman wrestler right now, like the woman mm -hmm. who, represents the future at least in mainstream american wrestling and everything like she's she's the one it's one of those where you know you're going to look back years from now and go like yep we, we got it on the money you know yeah yeah that's that was generally the feeling uh in the the virtual room as we discussed this there wasn't a lot of pushback on it, it really did you know sometimes we'll have the 500 meetings and we'll step in and like okay who else could it be but so and so you know when it seems like that person is a lock and that's how we started with Rhea Ripley. And nobody really had a convincing case for any, anybody else, nor did anybody really bother. I think uh, uh, Warren Hayes, not to call him out on this, but being in the room, I think considered make, trying to make a case for, for Julia as number one, but then kind of thought better of it. And that's not a knock on Julia. It's just that Rhea Ripley has been like the woman in WWE and despite a lack of activity at different points uh, on television, she has, as you said, Brian kept active at house shows and really her activity was pretty good before she had the belt on her too. It, it's kind of that idea that a heel champion doesn't necessarily need to be a fighting champion. And I, I agree or disagree with that. That is how WWE at least tends to approach it and AEW to some extent. Um, I think she easily met all of the other criteria. And again, her activity wasn't, so low that you would say, how could you possibly rank her in the spot? I think most of the debate honestly went over the rest of the top 10, which turned out a little different than I thought. I was honestly surprised to see so much impact representation in the top 10, um, even knowing how good that division is. And I was surprised to see um, that Athena was not in the top five. And me, I had her about number three, but you know, we got in the room and we discussed it. And that's not how it panned out. But these are, you know, again, things that you might talk about a little more in depth with another one of the, the committee members. Yeah, I think it, it's so, and one of the things I think is so interesting. Have we ever had um, somebody repeat at number one on the women's list? Nope. nope. Yeah, it, it's funny that the, the turnover from year to year, that those top tens look so different from year to year in a way that the, the PWA 500 uh, doesn't. And I'm not sure what to make of it, but I just think it's really interesting. And Bianca was in the top three the last three years. So that's, and there was definitely a back and forth about her last year. She was probably the closest to being a repeat, but you're right. Yeah. There's a lot of, a lot of turnover. And I think it speaks to the way that women's divisions are booked in a lot of cases. Um, I don't yeah. even know it's a bad thing because um, it, it keeps things fresh. And, and if there's one thing about the, the men's side, and I remember, you know, putting together the, the, the PWA 500 for all those years, it was always some kind of combination of Randy Orton, John Cena, Triple H, you know, move yeah. those pieces around year in and year out and year in, year out. And um, even now, I think there's there's still some complaints about, like, we need to freshen things up. I think the conversation we're about to have about LA Knight maybe does some of that. Um, but with, with the women, it's less of an issue. And it, maybe it touches on, again, the booking that it could be harder um, to to satisfy um fans uh 
of women's wrestling, wrestling and, and satisfy them with women's wrestling. There, there's still a bias against women's wrestling. I think there are still um, fans that see the women's match as the popcorn match if you go to the, the live show that, you know, so uh, I think because of that, there's more kind of experimentation of let's try this woman, let's try this woman. And with, with Rhea, I feel like they had been, you know, it had been this experiment years in, in the making. She's challenged for the world for a championship at WrestleMania or, or worked in a championship match at WrestleMania for three, four years now, I think, in a row. And I got to say, I, I never connected with her until this year. And I thought other times it's just like, I don't see it. It's it's not there yet. And and this is the year that I think it's a, a, a fully formed character, one of the most entertaining uh, things on WWE. I think she's fantastic. I think she is the leader of Judgment Day, in in my uh, opinion, and I think a lot of people's opinion, and the hottest part of that act, and it's a super hot act. So I think she's just banging on all cylinders. She's uh, really great. Uh, anyhow, that's not all that is in this issue. What else is in uh, here? Maybe you know better than I do. Don't make me flip these pages. Uh, well, there's a future story on Cruel, who was the IWTV Independent Wrestling World Champion. Uh, until he was forced to give that up by uh, by way of being injured. And interesting thing with him is that he has reemerged and somehow still has that original title belt. Um, and he's kind of going around crashing shows, forcing promoters to let him go on last and defend that that title that's not officially recognized. Um, so that's a really interesting story. I conducted it myself because that guy is scary as hell. Um, and it's very much in the vein of uh older uh 80, 80s early 90s era uh Rick Flair and the uh, digitized the digitized uh, tag team championship belt for <laughs> <laughs> jack sonny's ruling right yeah yeah, yeah. <clears throat> uh well there's a ton in here you don't want to miss it uh, go to pwa-online.com we just talked about the 500 uh, it's been out for several weeks now the women's 250 and uh, we are hard at work at the Tag Team uh, 100. I think it's going to be a newsworthy once again. So we are very much in ranking season. Before long, we're going to be, I'm sure, jumping, talking some awards. Oh, so, yeah, that, that issue has the awards ballot in it. So just mm -hmm. if you pick that up digitally or in print, you have a ballot, and that is your key to vote in the year-end awards. And once again, if you don't like how year-end awards shake out and you didn't vote, I don't want to hear it. Right. <laughs> it's not you guys, but readers. It's yeah. it's just this is not – we're not saying so-and-so is wrestler of the year. The only ones we pick are the Stanley Weston Award like for lifetime achievement. Everything else is voted on by the readers. And I know I count those ballots myself. I'm, I'm neck deep in them right now. Yeah, I'm always super curious about it, you know, because I've got my picks and and, and sometimes I'm so off base. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, pick up the issue. PWI-online.com. By the one, one issue, subscribe. You could, uh, we've got fantastic deals. We got back issues um, and uh, we've got the bundles now, right? We get digital and print, uh, both of them uh, for uh, one price. So, again, head on over to PWI-online.com for all things Pro Wrestling Illustrated. Uh, let's talk a little L.A. Knight and uh, Crown Jewel. Brian and, and I have been arguing about him for, for weeks. Let's bring Kevin into the, the, the conversation. You know, it, it really, it's the the, the proverbial uh, uh, rocket uh, strapped to him. But but this is really has been fast because it feels like just a few months ago, I was there in L.A. for for uh, WrestleMania, and he was in the, the Battle Royal, and the crowd's going crazy, and they did absolutely nothing with him. And so you start to lose hope. All right, they're, they're not going to get behind fans. Uh, but have they ever? And now, you know, one of the very rare Roman Reigns title uh, defenses uh, at a premium live event, a stadium show, no less. And it's L.A. Knight in that uh, challenger spot. Um, uh, uh, Kevin, I'll ask you, what, what do you think about the, the decision to, to go this hard with L.A. Knight? And I'll ask you both this. Is there a chance that he actually wins the championship? So I'll start off. I don't think there's a chance he wins the championship. I, yeah. I think they have... I, I, I'm fairly sure they still have their original ending uh, for this reign and that it's just been postponed. Uh, and that probably did not include L.A. Knight, uh, in part because Vince McMahon, as actually Brian wrote a very good column uh, for the next issue that's coming out about L.A. Knight and his journey. And, you know, one, th one of the things that he mentions is without <laughs> giving too much away um, is that Vince McMahon never really saw the value in LA night. But, you know, as quick as this ascent seems in some ways, it's been decades in the making and he's really been 
performing at this high level first on the independence and then you know uh t- at impact and then the nwa so he he has been it's the culmination of a lifetime of work for him and i think you might as well go with it and um you know the two of you talked about many times on this podcast there's just only so many challengers for roman reigns credible challengers who are fresh who are you know the fans are going to accept them in that role and i think this is a case where i, I keep thinking back to zach Ryder back when he was a you know a, an upper mid card guy but people really really loved him and even in his case and 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 maybe to some extent the same thing with la night now i don't entirely see why this person is popular to the degree they are but it doesn't matter if i see it the fact is that it's there and they should try to go with it in zach Ryder's case they arguably dropped the ball and did not go hard enough with him now had they gone farther and it didn't work that's one thing but you never you'll never know because they didn't in this case with la Knight, they are striking with the while the iron is hot so i think one way or the other you know if he gets into that position and he's exposed or doesn't seem ready for it which i don't think will be the case then that'll become apparent pretty quickly but i i think he's ready for it i think he's connecting on a really high level even just with the awards ballots he's already getting recognized in a few different categories Um, And I would not have predicted that a few months ago. So good for him. Good for WWE for uh, at least temporarily strapping the rocket if they're not going to go all the way with it. And I'm interested to see how he's, you know, received uh, not just at that match, but beyond it. Brian, we've had this conversation now, I think a few times over the last year where where there has been this situation where there is, um, and it's a credit to WWE that as dominant as Roman Reigns, has been they've been able to set up challengers that at least feasibly you know you could convince fans that they stand a chance and, and we saw it with drew mcintyre around this time last year at, at clash of the castle we saw it with uh, sammy Zayn at elimination chamber in, in montreal and there's this thought that like well even if this wasn't the original plan you know this guy is so hot call an audible put the, the belt on him do you think i mean would you make that call with la knight right now Um, I would not, but which is to me, so it's interesting to me because now it's like, and they don't want to paint themselves into a corner because there might be the concern of, okay, now we've pushed this guy to the moon, but if we're not ready to put the title on him and we put him in a title match, well, I guess he's got to lose that match. So then what happens then? But I, I think he is so hot and so over right now that I don't think losing that match would hurt him like uh, like in the way that i felt and i feared that it would hurt somebody like cody um i just feel like cody always felt to me more like he's on the razor's edge of like having what happened in aew happen to him again and i was very paranoid about having that happen to him so i always felt like you got to keep him as strong as possible but i don't think that's the case with la Knight. and you know I, i i think that he could lose it i mean Some of my gut instinct tells me, and they would never do this, but especially in the old days, this would be the perfect place to do kind of a a non-finish where, you know, he wins by DQ or something, or he, or he gets attacked and it's some kind of no contest, but I can't see them doing that in a match like this on a, on one of the Saudi Arabian shows and all that. I just, I just feel like there's too much riding on that to be like, an an all out everything you have kind of a show that I don't think they'd want to end it that way. Um, I think, you know, obviously, like Kevin was saying, he has not come out of nowhere. I mean, he was the impact world champion. And and, I mean, he's been a world champion. I mean, it's certainly nowhere near what it means to be the world champion in WWE. But, you know, he's been doing this for years. And and I think that's what's helped him now. Because one of the things, because we're talking about like the mysteriousness, right, of why this guy He comes across like a star and it's because he sees himself. And I think this is a shoot as belonging there so many times. And I think this is a problem. It's it's the downside of having the developmental system, which is we get to see these guys from when they're very young, when they're rookies, when they're inexperienced, when they're unsure of themselves. And a lot of the promos are like, well, I'm happy to be here and thank you for the opportunity. And I'm going to prove myself. Here's this guy who walks in. He's got 20 years of experience under his belt. And even if you don't know that, you know the guy's been around. You just know it. He's got a natural charisma. He walks in the room and basically says, you're damn right I belong here. Not only do I belong here, but that title belongs around my waist. Like there's no 
this is not the time to be humble. Like the fan, the fans respond to that. And he's a, he's a, he, he's a breath of fresh air by, for that reason. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the timing is interesting because they are going to this so quickly that as I think we all expect, if he loses, when he loses, or at least when he doesn't win, where do you go from here? I mean, inevitably it will have to be a step down because he went from working with um, the biggest star in in the, the business on uh, in the main event of a stadium show. Everything is going to be a step down from there. So almost by necessity, you you have to kind of pull back, and the the momentum stop starts to drop. So that's what's a little puzzling, just timing wise, about going with this. Now, the one thing, and and I think, um, you know, if that's the case, then there has to be some kind of consolation, right? I mean, it it, it has to shift to something else the one idea i i heard and this is you know fantasy booking but it's actually one that i i thought was a pretty good idea is um does john is this where we finally and this deals with another problem we talked about in the last podcast uh john cena kind of being lukewarm uh, right now and being part of the product could this be where we finally see the john cena heel turn you know does he come in and somehow cost la Knight uh this match and then you set up um a pretty interesting program, right? And with, with Cena and, and LA Knight, and you can ride that all the way to WrestleMania wow. if you wanted to, and it's a pretty hot match. Um, yeah, and it gives something, you know, it freshens up John Cena also. I I, I could tell you've put some thought and care into this, and I'm- This is not my idea. I saw this, uh, somebody no. else put this on Facebook or something. I have to say, because I've thought the same thing, like, where does he go? I almost thought like, well, maybe they should have paired him up with Seth and he could win that belt. But then you run the risk of, you know, Seth is a face that could hurt him because he's a new baby face and all this kind of thing. But I feel like if it wasn't for Roman Reigns, they've created this scenario now where like he can't lose unless it's something very special because of this huge record that he's got going and it's got to mean something. If it wasn't for that, if this was any run of the mill heel world champion, guaranteed, LA Knight at this point would get, even if you're saying, okay, he can't be the face of the company going forward for 10 years or whatever, I get that. But he would have, he would be getting a decent title reign, I feel. I think if it was anybody else, he, they'd give it to him for like six, eight months, nine months, whatever, and then maybe he loses it back. But because it's this whole like, oh my God, it's the Roman Reigns three year title reign, it has to be a very momentous ending. That that's the reason why I think it's even a question whether he should win or not. Yeah, yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, n- not much else otherwise on the show, uh, Kevin. I guess uh, Seth Rollins is defending his title on Drew McIntyre. Speaking of a hill turn, they've kind of been you know playing with it, but clearly that's the direction that Drew is going. They could certainly use another uh, strong heel on on the Raw side. There's nobody there. I don't think it's crazy to even put the title on on Drew. I mean, that's the the upside of having this other title is you can you know you can move it around. Uh, so can you see that happening, Kevin? I think more likely, possibly, but I think more likely we could still see a cash in. Ah, uh, yeah. I forget. Damian Priest. Um, and I think that, you know, kind of adds the element of surprise back in. He'll be there. He has a match with Cody earlier in the show, presumably earlier in the show. They might open with whatever, but, uh, I think it would be, uh, yeah, I, I would be surprised if Drew won won the title here. I, He's kind I think, of cold right now. I think Seth has something good going, and maybe it's biased because we have him as our number one ranked wrestler in the 500, but it's, you know, he, he's been building up this uh, goodwill as this babyface champion, as this guy who's going to go out and defend the title all the time. Um, and I think the fact that you even just have – well, I mean, of course, this goes contrary to what I just said about the cash in, but the fact that you have Roman Reigns in this very heel centric show in SmackDown, you know, you kind of have Raw offer uh, a counter to that in some ways. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 I'll check it out. Um, you know, a little bit of an, an off brand uh, event, but I think probably more interest than usual just because of the LA Night thing. So I'll be watching. Um, let's just talk about uh, impact. Not something we talk about too much, but um, then you know we just came off of their biggest show of the year, Bound for Glory. You were there, Kevin. I, I watched it. Another really good show. Impact keeps on delivering uh, really strong shows. And the big news at the end of the night was the return of TNA, uh, beginning in January, I guess, with the uh, the Hard to Kill. They were returning to the TNA name. 
I was as as uh, a big an advocate as anybody um, for getting rid of the TNA name, which um, I mean, one of the stupider, you know, branding decisions in, <laughs> in not just wrestling history, but just business history. Um, and it, it had so much baggage uh, for all the Dixie Carter years where it, it really was uh, uh, tainted so much. But I got to say, when I saw this, I thought, great idea. I mean, I, re I really did. I, I, I think that uh, Damore and Anthem have done a really good job in the last few years of um, moving away from all that baggage and kind of recreating uh, Impact Wrestling to where now I think it's got a, 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 a solid reputation as kind of a um, I don't want to call it low budget, but maybe it is. I mean, a, a modest production value. It it is not like the number two, and and I know that there are some folks over there that that maybe are delusional uh, about this. They've got their place in the wrestling business. It's not what it was um, ten or, or or fifteen years ago. But they put on a really, really, really good show. I think they've done a fantastic job again of of washing away all the stains from the Dixie Carter era. I don't have anything bad to say about the product. And I get that they are trying to own um, a lot of the the good that was associated with, with TNA. And and now it, it, it's been 21 years, right? I think there's kind of a nostalgia factor uh, built in. And I think Anthem has been really good about sort of focusing um, their their history on on the good parts on Samoa Joe on Kurt Angle on Christopher Daniels and AJ Styles and you know it's almost like in you know indoctrinating fans of like you know it was actually really good <laughs> you know and and focusing on those good parts and so when they um, revealed that the TNA name is coming back everybody erupts and it was just kind of this feel good thing TNA which is a chant I don't think you would have you know wouldn't have seen ten years ago so. Uh, I think they, they've done a great job. I, I think it's the right time to do it. Um, uh, I'll, I'll begin with Brian. I mean, w w what does it mean, though? Is, 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 does it matter? I think it's proof that if enough time goes by, people will get nostalgic about anything. Yeah. That's what I <laughs> because I've, I don't know. To me, I, I don't agree with you, Al. To me, what it <laughs> signifies is almost like capitulation. It's like... Not so much capitulation, but it's them saying, we have our core fan base and that's all we need. And we've made our peace with that. We have our 70,000 people a week that watch it or whatever it is. And they're going to be super thrilled about this and love it. And that's good enough for us. And I guess, okay, if that's their decision, but it's easy to forget how hard they work to erase that because of exactly the reason you said it's limiting, it's dumb it's you know it's it represents some of the more cringeworthy elements of the attitude era that we've tried to sort of get away from you know not the good element like la night represents like the good nostalgia i feel like for the attitude era you know but like the the stuff that maybe was ill-advised and i feel like they're just like yeah you know what let's just go back to it yay and yeah there's gonna be people that are gonna be thrilled about that because they're that hardcore base but i think for the rest of people that aren't watching or or have a, a vague idea or maybe remember those days and weren't fans so much, it's just gonna be like, oh my God, are they really doing this? Like, I think that is probably the more prevalent reaction you're gonna see. So that's yeah. my take. Let, let me rebut that and I'll throw to Kevin for a second. It's gonna be end up just being an argument with, with me and Brian and, and Kevin watching. <laughs> um, but 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 here's um the thing. I mean, you say that that they're just super serving. Um, their 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 fan base now. I'd argue that they've they've lost all these TNA fans who may not even know that that this is this has but been. You TNA. think they're going to come back because they changed the name? I mean, I, I I've think seen a few people lot, suggest it. Okay. Well, I think there's be a lot of fans that aren't even aware that it, this is TNA that it, that Impact was TNA and oh okay. is TNA still around? Even just people on social media, I've seen people get really start to get really nostalgic when they heard about the name. I'm like, oh, maybe I need to tune in again. Now, whether they do, whether they stick around, that's a different story. But that the, they did have like a bunch of, you know, even just things like changing which station it was on. How, yeah. You know, how long TNA's audience shows. was a lot bigger than Impact's ever was, right? Yes. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Of course. And, and, I, and, you know, and, and they do a lot of stuff now with their app. And also they've got like this free channel on what's it called? Pluto or something mm -hmm. um, where it, and, and, and even on on um, uh, what's their channel? I forget. 
uh, access TV. Access, yes. Uh, where they do like a lot of historical stuff, right? Like a lot of uh, clip shows and things like that. And the thing is, those are all like TNA branded, the big TNA logo on the ring. And so TNA is all over them. And then they go to their new product and it's something else. It's impact. It looks different. You you look at the two side by side, you wouldn't even know that it's um, the same company, which was the point of, of getting away from TNA be, because there was such a negative association. But again, I think they've done a good enough job of focusing on the the good parts of TNA that you can return now to that name and and um, to that familiar logo. I think I think there's a real plus in um, that familiarity. Do you, you agree, Kevin? Yeah. I so when it first happened, let me just say is the last. I don't know what I was expecting in that video, but the video package that they showed the pre-taped thing was spooky and kind of spine tingling. It was a bit much. Like, yeah. <laughs> it was a bit much, but it was like, well, okay, how do you end this? Like what, it has to be something really cool. And when it was that, I was like, huh. But everybody around me, and this was a sold out, you know, again, not, not a huge arena, but the Cicero Stadium in the suburban Chicago, completely packed. I can like, the, there was no kayfabe about that. How many people do you expect were there? <sighs> I don't know what the capacity is, but a few thousand. Yeah, it was. It was yeah, really. Which I, I think I don't think there's any anything wrong with that. You, this is, you know, number three promotion in the U.S. in terms of uh, viewership and visibility. I mean, they get in their defense access. They probably get when when firing on all cylinders, they get over six figures. But it it does dip under that if uh, if if it's not going as well or if they have strong competition. Um, plus whatever they get on YouTube and there are other things that are not counted in with that. Um, but certainly still the number three in terms of viewership in the U.S. But there was this sense, and I'm not sure how much of Scott Demore's uh, uh, promo that he gave to the audience was was shown. But there was this sense of like, you know, we're sick of being considered like a, a non-factor. We have this history as this company that actually, you know, was getting millions of viewers and you would be very hard for them to get back to that, even with access being very invested in them, owning the company and impact being, you know, it's top rated show and them giving these uh, other recap shows and things like that, that they'll air. Uh, supposedly they are investing a lot more money into this now. Uh, I, I don't know if that'll come with people with new contracts and things like that, but they're certainly talk of production upgrades, things of that nature, the branding. Um, I don't think they're going back to the six sided ring and I don't think they should because it's no, not, not, not good for work. It's just, it's a lot harder on people's bodies. Um, I think, you know, if you wanted to do it now and then as a special attraction, that'd be fine. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think you're going to see sort of a hybrid of what the, the product we've been seeing with some of the visuals of, of TNA. And the fact remains that that when they were at their most popular far and away, it was the TNA name. So um, it's sort of like Brian said, enough time passes, people forget about the the nasty and bad aspects. Um, and they're sort of re-embracing it and saying like, you know what, like, we're not going to pretend we're not this company. We're going to embrace, embrace the best aspects of it. Um, yeah. And I, I think I have to step away for a minute. I, I okay, think sure. I actually Absolutely. Uh, Al and okay. I can keep, keep agreeing with each other while you do. Um, yeah. But it, it's a situation where, you know, um, I was surprised to hear the announcement first of all. And then the second thing is I was shocked at how, just how popular it was with the live crowd. And I was at the TV tapings the next day and same deal. They kept chanting TNA the entire time, pretty much. Anytime something cool would happen, it would be a TNA chant. Um, yeah. And I thought for sure, okay, well, I'm going to go and I'm going to log on to Twitter and I'm going to see everybody making fun of this, this decision because it's going to seem like a step backward or blah, blah, blah. No. People, this is largely a very popular decision. Like it's hard to see the downside, you know. Yeah. Um, it, it, it especially if it if it doesn't, you know, if if the plan isn't well, we're bringing back Dixie Carter and Vince right. Russo and um, you know, whatever else, you know, cage dancers. Like yeah, well, yeah. Tasha Steeles was joking about wanting to be a <laughs> cage right. dancer. Yeah, I, I I think like now that they have really developed their their own product, right, and done a nice job of. Um, differentiating themselves from WWE and and AEW it is kind of its own thing i think in in it's a it's a very well-rounded product and i think the interesting thing is you and i now have gone to the last two um impact pay-per-views because i was at uh victory road uh, i think uh, yeah in in um in westchester uh, a couple months ago 
and you know, top to bottom, it was it was a a, a really well booked wrestling show where they had um, the you know really solid tag team action. Then they had the the X division kind of stunt stuff. They had the the hardcore stuff with uh, uh, Bubba and the tables and and like. Uh, and, and it was the same thing at, at Bound for Glory. You know, it you know you have some of the veterans in the mix, and then for the the main event scene, and, and this is something where they've really stepped up their their game. They've got world class workers working uh, main events, and I was very much on the fence about Alex Shelley as their uh, world champion because I was like, man, really, Alex Shelley? But since the TNA rebranding, I think it makes a lot more sense be- because he is sort of the best of both worlds, right? He is this. Yeah. Um, uh, still relatively, you know, um, I don't know how old he is. He's probably right around 40. He's, uh, yeah, I think he just turned. But honestly, I would I would argue that it's either him or Saban. One's 40, one's 41. But it, I would argue that Alex Shelley today is a better o- overall worker than he was. You know, I mean. He's like the he's, ring general, right? He trained Okada, right? I mean, I mean right. like that. that uh, uh, so, so, I mean, a, a world-class worker and he's yeah. got that that good TNA reputation, right? I mean, nobody's got bad memories of the Motor City Machine Guns, right? I mean, that even during the worst days of the TNA, of TNA, that that was one of the the bright marks, and um, yeah. and, and they're able to go back and and occasionally team them up. I saw them work together at, at Victory Road, and then he can also do uh, the main event thing with some credibility. So, you know, for for this moment in time, I think he's kind of the perfect world champion um, for for TNA. Josh Alexander, I I think uh, I think everybody's missing the boat. I mean I mean Im- Impact fans know it, but uh, yeah, this guy yeah. is so great, um, and they're not the only ones. I mean really up and down. ABC won the tag team title, a really good act. Um, you know the Rascals are, are a lot of fun. Uh, they've just done a re- and then you touched on it before uh, a super solid women's division, uh, right. top to bottom. So this is a really good product right now. I. I should add in too, and I Brian may have some additional thoughts like specific to the roster, but um, with Josh Alexander, there was a lot of talk about uh, the Will Ospreay Mike Bailey match from Bound for Glory, which was incredible, and it got I think it got five and a quarter stars from Meltzer. So, which I have to yeah, say about well, that. <laughs> but the point is, it's the first five star match in Impact in many many years, and uh, I think in the time that it's been called Impact, but he. he as good as that match was, I was at the TV tapings the next day, and I, I don't know what kind of interruptions will be in the match or how it's going to be structured uh, when it actually airs. For my money, the Josh Alexander match and Will Osprey match was even better than that match. It was just so, so, so good. And the things, if you're somebody who, and he, Osprey does a lot less of the, the flippy do stuff than he used to do. But if you're someone who's put off by that, there wasn't so much of that. I mean, he certainly, he does that. But a match with Josh Alexander, uh, who's not a high flyer, you know, can do a moonsault, but like is not a high flying guy. He's a, a technical wrestler. It kind of was just this great hard hitting match. I bet, yeah, that's it's, yeah, it's uh, also speaking of Osprey, I I don't think he ends up in Impact, but supposedly he's open to it, and especially, I mean, kayfabing it a bit, but saying he's open to be, you know, I TNA is what got me into wrestling. If they could throw enough money at that guy. Um, you build around him. You could do it six months, a year. It doesn't have to be a really like you give him a ton of money for a short run. You'll get a lot of eyeballs on the on the shows. Um, you know, I think he's someone that you. I mean, you would have to put the world title on. Um, but you know, you have yeah. him. You have you have Trinity. Um, I don't think CM Punk's going to land there. But you know, if they're not at least trying to throw money at him too, I'd be surprised. Um, he was he was visiting. He was hanging out at those shows. I didn't see him, but he was he was at the building um so anyway i, 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 I think there's a lot of intrigue around this and i, and I think it's good and I, I think especially when we're going to talk about aew but aew for all the good things about it has been a little uneven uh i i don't think anybody would argue with that lately yeah um and impact tna i think it's a little more cohesive i i i really agree yeah i mean uh, certainly not the production value that aew feels like more a big league Yes. Um, uh, impact, and and I'm I'm really interested in in these production upgrades to see how much more major league they they because it just looks you know like your local indie shot with like a camcorder outside the ring. Um, even when the product's really good, it just feels sort of low budget. 
so I, I'd be really interested in, in seeing them step up uh, uh, their game production value. Uh, but but let's talk about uh, you brought him up, Will Osprey, and I think it's such a, an interesting story. You know, essentially a, a free agent and a lot of suitors now. And interesting that that impact would even be uh, in the mix. But I think everybody is in the mix. You know, talked about as one of the it's, it's the one name that every year of the 500 we get some flack about where where he is and i think there are a lot of people who like to see him in that number one spot um but also kind of a polarizing figure i mean when you said that you know his match got whatever five and a half stars um and i and i saw it i saw i don't know if it was edited for tv but i saw um I, I, like a nine minute version of it so maybe they cut it down some and it was good it was, you know, but but oh, you're talking was, about the Mike the Mike Bailey match. The Mike Bailey match, yeah. Okay, um, yeah, I was saying the, the Alexander match was. Uh, and I feel like this, and I'd, I'd be interested in, in your take, uh, uh, Brian, as our our resident uh, uh, curmudgeon old man. <laughs> oh, but I don't know. I, I, I as far as 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 fans of old school wrestling go, I'm about as uncurmudgeon as they I'm get. <laughs> but but on. I well then, then I'll be the curmudgeon old man. I don't know that I get it. I think the guy is super talented, for sure. I hear you know Meltzer just pouring on the stars on all of his matches and I see them and they're incredible athletic feats right I mean this guy can do stuff that is in incredible and, and as you touched on he has pulled back a little bit on the flying stuff uh but you know I, I'll I'll say it he is overrated among some people right who who have him on the the upper and this is to say I don't know how well he works in, in WWE, and that's not necessarily a knock on him. I mean, some of it is just style. I don't, I don't know that that we saw what happened with Ricochet, right? And they were contemporaries um, for yeah. for a while, uh, and and I almost feel like Rico Ricochet maybe works better in WWE than than Will Ospreay does. And and now it's been a few. I mean, whether it was the uh, the Omega match at what was the pay per view earlier this year that they did the AEW pay per view? Was, was that, yeah, it was it for Door. Where it, it again, greatest match of all time. But I watch it, and I'm like, yeah, it's, I mean, it, it was a really good match. But I, I just think, I don't know. I'm, I'm not there yet with, uh, with, with Will Ospreay, which is not to say that I don't think WWE should absolutely be, be knocking on his door because, you know, free agents like these are, are so rare now, you know, like these, these big name stars that don't come from a WWE. I mean, you could count them on one hand, and, 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 uh, AJ Styles is probably, the last one kind of like a non WWE guy who has earned a reputation as a, a world-class star Omega would be another one that, that is a, a real commodity. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I think that, and it sounds like he's entertaining the idea of coming to WWE. I mean, I, I think as a fan, I, he probably realizes that the, these are the biggest of the big leagues. Uh, but Brian, I'll just throw it to you. I mean, what do you think about the, the Will Ospreay free agency fight? Where do you think he lands? Or where do you think he should go? I think, I mean, it goes without saying the best thing for his bank account is going to be WWE. I mean, we could set that aside. That goes without saying. You could say that about almost anybody. But I think if he comes to WWE, then he winds up becoming another Ricochet. And I'm glad you mentioned Ricochet. At least that's in, in my opinion. I What I mean to say, and I, I'm not saying that as a knock on him, I think he'd be wasted there. I think he's the kind of a guy who will shine as a star much more uh, certainly impact, but even more so in AEW, just because they have a, a bigger audience and his style, as we've seen, we've seen him there, you know, his style is more suited to it because I also think, and again, you can call me the ugly American and I have my biases and whatever, but from a promo point of view, he loses me. Yep. Uh, his matches are incredible. You know, I feel like he's going for like a guy, Richie kind of lock stock and two smoking barrels kind of thing. And to me, it's more like Michael Palin in Monty Python. You know, <laughs> that's what I, but again, I'm American. It's a little put on. Right. It feels like, hey, hey bro, I'm going to build. And then I, it's hard for me to take seriously. But again, I'm, I don't, that's just my limited, uh, you know, xenophobic point of view. What can I say? But I think like, it, but the reality is in WWE, that would be an obstacle that he'd have to get over with an American audience. I really do feel that. And I feel like once the bell rings, he's great. But in WWE, as we've seen so many times, it takes more than that. 
Whereas in AEW with their fan base, sometimes it doesn't take more than that. You know what I mean? So I, I, I think that would, I would go AEW with, for him. If he's thinking long-term and, um, you know, do I want to get lost in the shuffle or not? Like, it's not like he's, he's going to go broke or anything going there. I think that would be the place for him to be. It's almost so obvious to me. It almost even doesn't even need to be said. I, I, I really disagree, and, and it, I feel like you're almost making the case for why he should go to WWE, because I agree he has those shortcomings, and I think he goes to AEW, and they do nothing about him, right? I think they just, holy cow, we got Will Ospreay. Let's put him in a match with Danny Bryan, oh, with Brian Danielson. Let's put him in a match with Kenny Omega, and he could have a six-star match with this guy, and he could have a seven-star match with this guy, and and nobody really looking at, well, where are his holes? What, what needs to be improved? And I think he does get that in WWE. I think... Uh, a Paul Levesque will look at him and say, you're super talented. You can have amazing matches. There's some things we need to, you know, polish, right? And we'll do that. And it, 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 I think it'd be a real proving ground. Now, I, I know the easy, easy thing to say is to look at like a Ricochet and other guys and say, well, they're, they're not going to know how to book him and they're going to uh, kind of squander him. Maybe, or, or maybe they... Um, Look, they make them better, right? Maybe they, they again, they, they fill those holes. They identify. They've got that system, you know, and and um, I'm not saying you send the guy to NXT. I don't think you do. But I do think he benefits from being in, in that system where they're thinking about every aspect of your act, right? From the, 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 the promos and looking in the camera the right way and your entrance and, you know, all of it. And, I again, I think he goes to an AEW and they're just sort of like, I also think within, you know, two months, he's, you know, working collision on a Friday with, you know, uh, in, whatever indie worker. And, and, and as they rotate through guys in the main event, it's just too crowded over there. So I actually think WWE would be a really good move, even if it's a huge gamble, you know, even if, right, you might end up ricochet. Um, but you could also, uh, think, and Ricochet's had an okay career, you know, it's, it, it's, he has, but I mean, I, I brought, we, I think he gets brought up because especially like those two guys had, you know, right. matches that were talked about and they were seen as being here. Here's the thing. They were seen as like this at one point. They are not now. I don't think anybody would look at them that way now anymore. Maybe I'm wrong. And it's because I think Ricochet has been devalued being in WWE again. His bank account hasn't been devalued, but I think right. his profile in the industry has been. And I'd be worried about that happening. I think the best case scenario for him in WWE is a parallel to him I see as being Finn Balor, Prince Devitt. Mm -hmm. I feel like he could be, but again, that's also, that's not a guy who is going to be in the main event of WrestleMania, but he's doing well. He's well positioned. He's in a, a prominent faction. Like he's, I guess, upper mid card type of guy that could get plugged into a main event if you need. That would, I think, be the best case scenario with him in WWE. And I, and I think he's bigger than Finn Balor, right? I mean, I think he's got yeah. some size over. He's he's not a small guy, uh, uh, Will Osprey. I mean, I th I, th I think he's yeah. he's fine. So you know, I, I I think you could look at and he could look at Ricochet and both uh, either be uh, uh, discouraged, uh, uh, demoralized, or maybe motivated and saying that's not going to be me, right? You know, and and I'm not just the guy who does flips and stunts and and. Uh, and not saying that I think that's what Ricochet uh, is, but that that's certainly how people in WWE, decision makers at WWE have seen him and it's what's uh, held him back. But he could go there motivated saying, no, I, I am multidimensional. I could do that stuff, but I could do a lot more stuff. And like you touched on Finn Balor or AJ Styles or, or all these guys who've had really good careers in WWE uh, and kind of come from that that mold. So, Kevin, what do you, what do you think about um, a Will Ospreay in WWE? Um. I hope it doesn't happen. I think there's really? a mute, yeah, I, I think he becomes a muted version of himself there. Um, in part because I, I don't think they, I'm not even saying there aren't people there who can go like he can go because obviously there are, but it's, I don't think WWE wants to put on that kind of uh, match. And I, I'm not even saying like from a high risk standpoint or whatever, because Osprey has toned down and tried to make his game safer. Um, I don't know. I have a lot of uh, contradictory thoughts about it because I think on one hand, yeah, I, I don't think he's quite, I don't think he's as good as, as say Dave Meltzer thinks he is. And, and it's, and I think he does have very good matches and it's good storytelling, but 
to me, there's this, I, I hate to go back to like the intangible, the inf, it factor or whatever, but there's a quality that Kenny Omega has, who has similar types of matches that I don't see in Will Ospreay. Not yet. Um, there's like an intensity, a believability that he's in a fight. I don't. And I think Osprey certainly like the offense looks great and he sells well and all this, but I think there's, there's just a couple little bit of connective parts that um, I, so I, I think there are some things that he could stand to improve in that regard. That, that just my taste, but I will add that seeing him in person, I think he comes across way better in person. Like he does, he's one of those wrestlers where when he steps into the room, you feel the change in the room, the aura changes. Um, you know, like when a Brian That's Danielson an impact show, I mean, that you know, he he was he's the big fish over there, right? You know, like, he, yeah, he's yeah. A, he was the biggest star on that show, but I would compare it to like even like a I don't think he he quite has the intensity and aura of uh Kazuchika Okada when making his entrance, but it's like that where you have a change in the oh, okay, this guy's a big shot, and mm -hmm. as you said, he did kind of he like he beefed up, he moved from junior heavyweight to heavyweight. I um. You know, like it all automatic. At the end of the day, it comes down to whether, like, what his goals are and what he wants to to do. I think there are challenges that he could face anywhere. I think there's probably a scenario where his promos could be, where he's just allowed to shoot from the hip a little more, um, but in in a way that's like a little more vulnerable. Um, like the arrogant heel thing doesn't work for me from him. I, I think oh, I agree. There's enough, but like when he talks to the crowd and thanks you for coming and talks about his opponent from that evening and talks about like the rest of the show and all this stuff. He has uh, like the confidence and I wouldn't call it arrogance at that point. And I think he'd actually be like a, a very good high level baby face for that reason in any of these companies. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think my gut tells me that regardless of where any of us thinks he ends up, I think there's just as good of a chance that new Japan resigns him. Um, they're going to have to throw more money at him, but he can be treated like a very big deal there. He hasn't had the prolonged world title run that arguably he deserves for the work he has put in there. Um, he gets in the ring with, I mean, you could see it in the, the G1 climax tournament from this year. And I, I watched every day until I couldn't possibly keep up anymore. And like, I was in the hospital and things. And like, I don't need to go home. And also, uh, no, I'm not going to say a name, but like, I, I don't have to watch this person's matches, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, Osprey would be in the ring with guys who were considered way beneath him in terms of like work rate and abilities. And he would get the best matches out of them. Mm -hmm. um, so I think wherever he ends up, that's a potential upside, but I could just as easily see him ending up in New Japan as I could him finally uh, landing in AEW as a as an all elite contractee. Yeah, and maybe that's better for him. Yeah, I I, I think all these things, you know, and the, the more we we discuss it, the more I'm sort of convinced. Like all these things point to him going to WWE being the right thing. You know, whether whether it's New Japan or or Impact or AEW, the reality is to to various degrees, all those companies are kind of lukewarm to cold right now you know none of them are having you know a great business period wwe is wwe is, is red hot right now and they could use more top stars i mean that's why i think you know they they jumped at la night was like well we, we need more main eventers they've got um seth roman who never works cody um you know to some degree i guess now la night but that's why we're seeing guys like nakamura and drew mcintyre um mm -hmm. uh in, in the main events. So I think there's an opening right now for a guy like Will Ospreay, who's 30 years old. I just looked that up while we were talking. He's only 30 um, and, wow. and has this reputation as a world-class star. I think he can come in through the door with a, a big push. And I think, you know, the other big difference with Ricochet was remember, you know, Ricochet came in when Vince was running things. I think Paul Levesque is going to have a, a, a much uh, more of an appreciation to what a Will Ospreay could bring to the table and we've seen, you know, whether it's petty or not, you know, we've seen that there uh, WWE will still go real aggressive against AEW. I mean, as much as they want to deny that this competition, you know, we saw what was it, the Undertaker on NXT a few weeks ago, as ridiculous as that was, <laughs> and John Cena and and a bunch of other people. Um, so if it becomes a, a a bidding war, I think WWE easily outbids. Uh, I shouldn't say easily, sure. but I think that they could put some money behind it. I think they could get Will Ospreay. 
And I don't doubt that they would push him hard um, out of the gate. And I think it's good for Will. I think Will becomes um, – and and I think we – we it seems like we all agree that Will Ospreay is not as good as some people think he is, right? But, but I would say – I think he's got the potential to be just as good or, or better. So it's not a guy who I look at and say, I don't see it. I, I see it. I, I I think it's not there yet. I mean, I think you got to get it out of him. But I think he's a great looking guy. Uh, I, I think he's incredibly athletic. He's, I think he's got the swagger and all that stuff. Um, it needs to be molded. And um, I, I, I think a shop like WWE and, and the infrastructure they have there uh, – if there's goodwill and it's not like, uh, again, the Vince McMahon WWE were, whether it was Ricochet or an LA Knight, it, it, you know, it's almost like instant sabotage with, with Vince. I mean, you, they bring you up just to kind of like squash you. I, I think, um, with the, the right people in place and, and with the triple H running things, I think he brings in a Will Ospreay and tries to get the, the most out of them. And it's in their interest to have this, a, a brand new international star who's only 30 years old. Well, the da- the downside of the WWE system is that they sometimes can be almost spiteful, and we've seen it happen where it's like if someone is like what they view as an indie sensation, they feel like they have to like break them, you know. I mean, and that's the downside of it. The upside of it is that some of them they polish and train and they help and they get them better, but sometimes it feels like they're trying to like knock them down to size, which is weird because you think that they would want them to be as valuable as possible. And I think they've been moving away from that, which is really encouraging to see where they see. I think it's almost like Cody, not that he's an indie guy, but like Cody was the beginning of that, where there was this amazing quote that he said in the documentary that they did in him that he claims that Vince said to him, which is not in line with the Vince that I have ever knew, which is like, this is what we're buying. Why would we change you? You know, because he was like, I don't want to change, you know, and Vince said, like, that's what we're buying. Um, They need more of that attitude. That's the thing. And so but that's the so that's the downside. I think if they if if it's a positive relationship and they try to do their best with him in good faith. Yeah, it could work. I think there's people there that he absolutely could have incredible matches with. I would love to see him and Seth Rollins. I think that would be be unbelievable. Yeah. I just don't necessarily have the faith that they'd be able to handle him the right way there. That's and there's a little history there. Remember that uh, yeah. we had Will Ospreay in the podcast some years back, um, and I asked him about it. Remember, there was they were taking some shots a couple of years ago, him and, and yeah. Seth. So um, yeah. that's kind of a built in. So I don't know. The more I talk about it, the more I'm really interested in seeing it. And and uh, you know maybe at WrestleMania, uh, I you know yeah. that's said. I I don't know how WWE fans react. I don't I don't. I think you could push him like a star, but I think you got to kind of tell the story that this guy's a star. I don't think it's like a Cody Rhodes where he shows up and everybody. Right. But I think you can, but I think there are certain like, or even AJ, you know, they can, and they're going to be picky about what they're willing to show the clips from because I mean, even their UK partnerships, most of them, and those have been dissolved now. Um, But there are ways that you can uh, um, tell that story without, I mean, I don't know. I, I don't think WWE is even totally opposed. They they reference New Japan all the time on commentary yeah. now. Like it's not they don't they don't view it as something that they have to bury. Um, now, supposedly, I, it, rumblings a, a few weeks back about WWE trying to get more of a foothold in Japan. Maybe that changes it. I also think a little bit foolish of WWE to think they're going to get a full a foothold in wrestling in Japan at this point. But that's a whole other conversation. Um, I would just like to add with Osprey uh, the fact that the mere fact that we're talking about. We're saying, you know, not as good as he as as not as good as he thinks he is, not as good as some other people think he is. But like, we're also talking about he could be working Seth Rollins at WrestleMania, which pretty much means that he's not perfect, but he's very, very good. Yes. Yeah, we're talking about having him in that conversation. So it's, I think anybody, it's like um, the show Community. Do you ever watch the show Community? Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, Love yeah. It. I resisted that show for years because people would not shut up about how it's the funniest, most clever show of all time. It was such a mistake because I ended up loving the show, mm-hmm. but the fans were obnoxious. And I think they, the way they built it up, nobody could be that funny or nothing could be that good. But once I let go of that and enjoyed it for what it was, yeah, it's one of my favorite shows now. So it's just, um, and I think Will Ospreay is kind of like that too. And I, he's certainly not the first, I, I think back to, uh, Brian Danielson and Ring of Honor, who was this incredible worker. And I think 
other parts of his game and he could cut a promo too, but like there were parts of his game that he really stepped up and a cohesiveness that he developed in the WWE system. Sure. He's a good, enough. another good example. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and doing this at this high level on TV for, for years and the repetition of it and the not being on a, so, you know, there, there are different ways that, that you can do that. And Osprey could just as easily uh, do that um, in Japan if he has the right people or, who are around him, who are encouraging the right things. So. Yeah, I, I I sort of think the, the worst thing for him is is AEW, and I'm sure he'd get paid well. And 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 some people would say, "What are you talking about?" He'd go there and he'd be in the main events and he'd get the world title, and that's all true. And 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 I think Omega is is a, a good parallel. You know, here's the reality. Yeah. You know, in, in our bubble, Kenny Omega is a big deal. He's been number one in PWI 500 twice, right? You know, he he is a big wrestling star. Kenny Omega walks through my local mall um, today. And almost nobody's going to stop him. You know, Kenny Omega. I go to the GameStop uh, nearby and in clearance there, every time I go there is the big Kenny Omega uh, stuffed Street Fighter doll. K Kenny Omega is a star among wrestling fans. He, he is not um, he's not a household name. He's not a, a mainstream star. And I think he has um, hit. But in hit, fairness, hit. neither is Finn Balor. Al. Like if you're no, but he's more. Of a, but he's more of a star. I mean, like because um, he's because if you're in WWE, you're more of a star. You know that 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 is just the 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 reality. You know, and 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 as evidence of that, watch AEW and and watch who's getting pushed in in AEW, and it's the WWE I guys. Think, I think he's bigger than that. I think I think that Kenny Omega, not to split hairs on it, but I do think that he would definitely be recognized walking in large public places not mobbed like if it was brad pitt walking through there or something or even roman reigns i agree but i would i think that he'd get especially in a mall where you get that younger demo i, I think he'd be getting spotted by people i just think that i know the toy you're talking about i think it's awful i think because <laughs> i'm in GameStop with my son all the time too and and it's a dumb idea for a toy and and, and it's a concept that i think people just don't what is it again they have these themed uh, almost like it's like a wrestling buddy, but it's like themed for Street Fighter for some reason. So it's oh. like if Kenny Omega was in Street right. Fighter as a wrestling buddy, like yeah, that's really right yeah. that's a high concept. Yeah, that's it's too many concepts at once. Yeah, on the hat, and I don't think it's clicking with people. I think that's not a knock on Kenny Omega. I think he's look, he's not at the level of a WWE main eventer in terms of recognizability. Right. But I do think he's got more recognizability than than most people in the wrestling business today, um, as, especially as an AEW home, uh, not homegrown, but as somebody, let's just say as somebody who's never been in WWE. Yeah. He's got to be at or at near the very top of the list of those people. Well, that's sort of the point is that's about as big a star as you can be not yeah. having worked for WWE. Okay. And yes. I'd say it is it is a, a pretty significant margin margin below a wwe star um and this is all to say will osprey becomes a bigger star for what that's worth and maybe some people don't even want it right i mean whatever whatever that the value is of just being a big star and fame and all that stuff and obviously money comes with it but aw could pay him just fine but i but i think in terms of legacy in terms of uh reputation all that stuff will osprey um can mean more in uh, a WWE, especially a young guy, 30 years old. And, and again, I, I think there's an opening there, you know, WWE, what's Roman, you know, 37, 38 years old. Cody's 37, 38 years old. LA Knight's 40. Um, this is not a young roster. And I think a, a, a guy like him with the upside that he has, you know, he can make a big difference. So uh, I hope that's where he ends up. Uh, uh, before we, we had out, let's talk a little bit about uh, uh, AEW and um, you touched on it, Kevin. Another big announcement. It's, it's it's a joke now at this point. You know, Tony Khan with the uh, announcements. Y any sense? Of, well, I'm not asking if you have any inside order, but uh, speculation. I I'll say it's, it, it, I, you know, I've sensed a little more kind of like tepidness about this one. And they're not saying biggest thing ever, but they said, I don't know, major announcement or something like Wait, that. Wait, so was another announcement announced was another today? One coming? What is there's it? One, yeah, didn't they? Or, or did I miss one? There was one last night. Oh, what was last night? I don't even know. Last night's announcement. So we're recording this on Thursday. Um, it was that there was a, a an important announcement, and then I think the graphic may have been changed to huge announcement or something like that. <laughs> but the announcement was ostensibly that Wembley is hosting All In again, which we knew. The date of it, which we knew. This was all announced 
pretty much, I think it was during All In this was announced or right after. Um, and the big announcement was that tickets are going on sale in December with a pre-sale beforehand. Well, so the okay. definition of this could have been an email, basically. 100%, <laughs> and a lot of people said as much, but like it's it, it's it's unfortunate because I think this kind of stuff looks very carny. There's really no other way to put it. It's like you're you're trying to get people to tune in for something, hoping it's something bigger, and then you're going to under deliver. Like there's no way anybody thought that was going to get a, a gigantic reaction. Like that's just trying to drum up excitement. You could have not mentioned it at all, and then it would have been a really cool surprise during the show that oh yeah we can buy tickets pretty soon for this. Or you could have said information. Uh, Tony Khan has an announcement about all in, and you're probably still going to underwhelm a little bit that way, but you're not letting people's imaginations run wild because some of these other announcements, at least earlier on did, did pan out very well. Yeah. So there's this high expectation sent out of the gate for it. And then you have, yeah, it's not respectful to your fan fan base. It, to me, it's the equivalent of announcing a match and not, and not delivering on it. I, I, I think, I, which is something AEW used to get a lot of credit for not doing that WWE would, that you didn't, yeah. you didn't treat your fans like dupes. You didn't, um, you didn't promise them something and then pull the rug out from under them. And I think uh, if you're going to be an alternative or a challenger brand or whatever you want to call it, that's one thing that, that people really loved about AEW and you don't want to lose that. I almost get the sense and I'm trying to give the benefit of the doubt, but I almost, part of me wondered if there might have been a bigger announcement mm -hmm. that fell through. And and so, and I feel like that may have even happened other times where it's sort of like, well, if it falls through, we'll just mention this other thing. Like I'm trying to be nice. One thing, but one thing I'll say is because there was a big rumor leading up to this that it was going to be the announcement was going to be that AEW is coming to Max, the streaming platform Max. And then the story came out. There's this news story that's been rumbling that um, uh, there's another company, I think it's NBC Universal, that's heavily bidding to get the NBA and maybe other kind of sports rights, steal them away from Warner Brothers Discovery, so that would take it off TNT and TBS. That's a huge cash cow for them. And there's a possibility that they may be holding off on what they're going to do with AEW until they – know whether or not they have that money coming in from and from the nba and possibly the nhl and that this may have held up a possible announcement of aew going to max because they're waiting to see where the nba goes now i have no idea if that's what this is but right. it's possible because you know i feel bad because <laughs> tony khan catches a lot of crap online and from fans and I get the impression that he's sensitive to it. And so I feel bad. You could see he's not somebody that lets it roll off his back, like let's say a Vince McMahon or something. So I don't like to pile on. But there's times like this where it he doesn't make it easy, you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> where you have to call it out. Like you said, Kevin, I think that's an apt description. And I'm just hoping maybe there's an explanation for it. I don't know. Yeah, Tony Khan's lost so much goodwill, I think, over the last year um, over a lot of these announcements, a lot of the social media stuff. Um, he seems sort of tone deaf to a lot of these things. You know, when, when there was that absurd, um, was it Wednesday night or Tuesday night, a, a battle a few weeks ago with NXT, and, um, you know, NXT destroyed them, right? I mean, it wasn't even close. And he, he tries to spin it the next day saying this is the first time that Undertaker and John Cena have appeared on a show that drew less than everybody, which is kind of eye rolling. And, and it's just like, well, somebody shut this guy up. Um, so, uh, yeah, guy's not doing himself uh, any favors. AEW is um, it, it it's such a kind of like a walking contradiction because in some ways their product is so great. And in other ways, it's just like dead and. And, and uh, we mentioned before we started recording about that that image of of Sting announcing his retirement, and then there was those uh, pictures that kind of went viral of of and and there have been a lot of these in recent months, but this one I think was per particularly impactful because it is Sting in a ring announcing his retirement, and the place looks empty. You know, it it it. it um, and granted, you're looking at the hard camera side, so I'm sure there are a lot more people on on the other side. 
Uh, but there's no two ways about it. We've talked about it. I mean, attendance is, is really down at these shows. Their, their ratings are, are not great. Every week there's, you know, I don't know if you want to call it an excuse, but they say, oh, this is the NBA or this is football or something. Um, but it, it does seem like certainly compared to where they were uh, a couple years ago, even last year, um, it, it's just not a hot product. And yet a lot to, to really enjoying it and, uh, on it, including I'm really enjoying Babyface MJF. I mean, it kind of snuck up on, on us, you yeah. know, um, like we were waiting on like, when's he going to turn? When's he going to turn? And and there really wasn't a turn. It was sort of gradual. I mean, a lot of it came with the, the partnership with Adam Cole. But um, I, I think, think that was really by worked. design so that it was more believable. I, yeah. I, and I, really again, I don't, I don't, I don't it's know. The yeah. What, uh, 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 Kevin, what do you think about MJF as a, as a baby face? I, it's, it's working really well. It's funny. Right. He's right. using some of these really old tropes between the, uh, the kangaroo kick and the ultimate yeah. warrior rope shake and <laughs> getting people to chance sportsmanship, which is not anything anyone had done. But, um, yeah, it's it's working, and I mean, he's still consistent in that he's kind of. There are moments where he's hesitant to embrace the role, like we saw it last night on on Dynamite, where he didn't want to uh, scissor with the acclaimed after the main event and things like that. And then, uh, and Billy Gunn, by the way, got it. I'm pretty sure got an f bomb through uh, when he was telling him <laughs> off mic to <laughs> just completely not caught. Um, but it was his birthday, so happy birthday, Billy Gunn. Uh, <laughs> turned 60 yesterday. Wow. Um, no, I, th I think MJF is, uh, you know, he's coming across as a star. I think they're doing a good job building up Jay White um, in that match for the Full Gear pay-per-view. Um, the women's division was handled very well in this week's Dynamite, which is not something that's, I mean, it's that's that's the been the biggest weak spot throughout for AEW, uh, in my opinion, and the opinion of a lot of other people is um, inconsistency in booking there. Um, and then, you know, I think sometimes they run into problems um, in that you have this very high impact style and you have a lot of other things. You have people who, uh, who may be getting a little bit on in their careers, having worked that style for a long time. So you certainly have a lot of injuries in WWE that uh, stop storylines too, but I think AEW has just hit some bad luck with that. Mm -hmm. But some of this is, as you said, it, you have to have um, like an eye on quality control and things like, so something like if, if this was a still photo of Sting, the Sting announcement with the empty seats. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Which, which was, uh, yeah, it wasn't put a hard, out. Hard cam side. Yeah, so, yeah. So, I mean, the difference there is that probably WWE would have, the right amount, a certain amount of seats filled, and then everything else would be blocked off. Like it would have a tarp over it or something, so that it on if it popped up I on think camera, there, it there were. Off. But but you know, even at WWE, and I've been in WWE shows with low attendance for sure over the last several years when yeah. the park hasn't been so hot. But um, th well, there is a a amount an amount of fans that no amount of uh, production work can you know, disguise the fact that this is not a good attendance. Sure. I mean, I think they, so some of that is, is tightening it up, but as you said, there's only so much you can do with that. That doesn't mean there haven't been production issues. I mean, there are people pointed things out at different points with the audio and mm -hmm. other things going, you know, cutting to things that they weren't supposed to cut to and thing. And, and it happens at WWE, but not as, as often. Um, it happens much less in a pre-tape product like impact or some, or some of the, uh, AEW shows that are, you know, like a rampage or something like that. Um, but I think one of the things you could do is sort of lean into, yeah, run like some of those venues that uh, NXT would have run, like these, these boutique, mm -hmm. these, these, and these co cool places. Like, don't, don't make it look like, hey, we're running a small place because this is what we have to do. Run the Hammerstein Ballroom or something like that. Like, uh, run a place that you can WWE. reasonably fill up. Yeah. Like, and then that'll, that'll uh, kind of, uh, there'll be some interest and some novelty just in seeing people seeing the show in these buildings and, you know, reliably they'll, they'll do so much business anyway. AEW becomes a hot ticket again. You have these shows are sold out. And then when you have a pay-per-view, it's a little bit easier to fill up the arena because people want to get out yeah. and see it because they haven't had a chance in a while. And because this is a big show with higher stakes. Um, 
but I, I think there's this tendency to want to do everything bigger and too much at once. And sometimes it really works because you have the right confluence of circumstances. You have a Wembley. There was this huge interest in wrestling in the UK. There was the fact that AEW has a good, really good TV positioning and gets better ratings than WWE over there. Um, and there was a demand to see the product live. But I, I think they're going to have a really hard time selling uh, even 70,000 tickets again this year if they unless they really you know kind of get hot again in this perception about the product changes and I, I think some of that comes from consistency and from putting your best foot forward yeah they, they announced uh, just recently they're coming to to my backyard here on long island nassau coliseum with this uh, new pay-per-view on december 30th that'd be really interesting because um that building's not used that much but but it seats probably fifteen thousand fans mm. uh at capacity MJF in the main event, you know, presumably I'd, I'll be really interested in in what kind of uh, crowd they can they can get there. They've done all right at the UBS Arena, uh, which is the other venue on Long Island, but the product was hotter now. Was hotter than when they were. They haven't been there in about a year and a half now, uh, sure. so I'll be really interested. Yeah. Uh, all right, guys, we're right around around the one fifteen mark. Uh, so uh, let's wrap up. Thank you, Kevin. As always, always good to have you on. Thank you uh, for joining us, uh, uh, Brian. Anything you want to promote before we head out of here? Um, I guess I could just mention my podcast, Shut Up and Wrestle. I've been having some really cool guests lately on the show. I've got uh, Brian Alvarez. You're getting Dave on, right? Dave LaGreca. Dave LaGreca. In the, he's he's uh, a planned future episode. We recorded it. Um, I think by the time this comes out, my guest will be Brian Alvarez. So, I mean, I've been trying to get people like that in wrestling media to talk, you know, people who can talk about past and present wrestling and kind of make comparisons and things, which I like to do. So, yeah, you know, you can find it wherever you get your podcasts. Shut up and wrestle. Okay, great. Well, thanks so much, guys. Appreciate you listening, and we'll be back soon.